Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared. Welcome to another episode of All Things Crime. I've got my buddy Tom Myers with me, and we are going to discuss a case that it's interesting. There's a, it's tied to a number of other cases out in Florida. And to me, as a parent, this is one of my worst nightmares. And I just can't even, even fathom it. But before we actually get into the case, I want to bring up our sponsor this, uh, for this episode is MVAC Systems. MVAC is a wet vacuum that sprays a sterile solution down, vacuums up forensics DNA, Investigators are using it to help solve cold cases and active cases all over the world. So if you're an investigator and you don't know about the MVAC, you need to contact them at www.vac.com and, or you can call them at 801-523-3962 and we can send you some information. So, all right, Tom, Jennifer Odom, 12 years old. Uh, 1993, she's getting off of a school bus and she has to walk all of 200 meters to get to her, her home. Uh, her friends say that there was a, a kind of a beat up blue pickup truck that was following her. But, you know, this is just like one of a, a millions and millions of kids who ride the school bus. They get dropped off somewhere close to their house. I mean, personally, my kids... Uh, their, their bus stop is, it's probably a couple hundred meters away, but you know, it's just a walk through the neighborhood to get, to get home. Most people don't even, uh, don't even look at, at the cars that are going by and they've done it so many times. I'm sure every kid is just kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, it's just somebody from the neighborhood. Well, for Jennifer Odom, uh, 12 years old. So she's probably seventh grade. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen pictures of her cute girl, never made a home. And, uh, like, like I said, this is every parent's nightmare. And they, they find her a number of days later, uh, in an abandoned, uh, orange, um, orange tree field and she'd been raped and murdered. So Tom, uh, you're a parent and, um, what, uh, you know, you have daughters What's, uh, what's your first impression of this case? Right. So goes back to the leopard doesn't changing it, not changing its spots. Again, this guy's got a huge criminal history and a horror show. I will say that every time we take one of these guys down, which is the awesomeness that's going on with the DNA work out here, work going on out there rather is gives back a piece to the community. Yeah. You know, they ask not for who the bells toll tolls for thee. Meaning every person dies from a person and it kills the whole community is what I'm saying when something like this happens. But I think every time a great piece of work like this is done, you rebuild that community brick by brick and case by case. So awesome work, awesome work. But this, this animal, this Jeffrey Crumb, I guess that's the only time we'll mention his name on this here. Going back to at least 1980 in my notes, uh, and patching this together is not easy. Pulling it from multiple strands of information out here, news articles and things like this, but it goes back to 1980, predates essentially sexual assault kits, but he had a sex battery uh, court case and, and then all the way through. So it does not change his spot. Uh, Leopard doesn't change his spots and he ends up in prison in between. Almost identical case is what essentially did him in. And I suspect the uh, law enforcement agencies that were working this essentially knew it was the same person. It matches the MO. So we go with Jennifer being the victim in 1995, three years prior, we have an abduction rape, uh, almost same circumstances of a 17 year old who thankfully survived the attack. We have to assume that biological material, meaning semen was recovered from that. And that eventually leads to a, a code is hit, but we're trying to figure out why didn't that code is hit bounce against something. Probably it precedes the time when CODIS entries were mandated in the state of Florida, or somehow he slalomed around that. We've seen that before. Um, or somebody doesn't complete the information loop. 
regardless, we, um, he's arrested on the 1992 case in 2017 and is sitting in prison since 2019 as he's a convicted sex offender. And then we walk up to this case. So it tells me that the investigators took their time. The strategy on this, of course, is there's no sense expending numerous resources when you have hands on this guy and he's not going anywhere. You don't, you're not going to suffer the loss of evidence or him fleeing the area. Um, and he's not going to kill or rape or murder, rape or murder or attack anybody, uh, in between. So they can take their time and do it correctly. And it sounds exactly what they did, what they did, but they went through the grand jury proceeding. So good work, you know, good strategy all the way around. And there's just a limited amount of resources. But to speaking about this guy with the patchwork quilt, this is what we call, you know, the criminal justice system, system, what happened on that. Yeah. And the, the fact that he is in prison serving two life sentences. And, uh, now that this case, this Jennifer Odom case is, is, has been solved. They, they're charging him. They want to give him the death penalty. So, I mean, he's 61 years old. He'll, he'll sit in prison for, you know, who knows, 20, 25 more years. And, you know, that I, frankly, I think they just want to get rid of him. And, and so I have no problem with, uh, them going after him with, a, with a death penalty because, this guy is just, to me, he's the worst kind of animal. And, you know, sexual assault against an adult is bad enough. But when you're targeting children and, and from the pattern that I'm seeing, he is, he is a sexual predator, but he's also a sexual predator. He's a pedophile. And so he's going after young girls that are just, just maturing and, uh, but they're, they're also easy targets. You know, I, again, I, I have kids that are right around that age. And as far as their situational awareness, understanding what's around them, they're pretty clueless. And, you know, even back then, you know, they didn't have cell phones to stare at and, and things like that. And so the kids today are even worse. You know, they, they have no comprehension of the danger that's surrounding them. And it's, and it's really sad, but at the same time, I mean, in the middle of all of this and some of these, uh, you know, rapes and assaults and sexual battery that this guy was uh, caught and convicted of, he served 18 months. I mean, how, how is this animal even out on the streets? You just have to kind of worry, you know, wonder about that. And just kind of, if you go back and look at his history, I, I think it's, I think it's indicative of, of our forgiving society and letting these guys back out. But in my opinion, Sexual assault predators do not, you, you can't reform them. Th those guys, they don't change. And they are, I think once they're convicted of this kind of stuff, the, the sentences need to be way, way more harsh. And enough of this, you know, pleading down stuff. I, I, th I think there's so many plead, pleading agreements that they, they, they'll, they'll go from first degree sexual assault all the way down to, you know, misdemeanor type things. And so they're, they're getting out with time well served or, you know, good behavior when they get, actually get behind bars. And I, I think they're just trying to skate underneath the system and, and then they get back out on the streets. And based on this guy's history, it's obvious that he was, I, I'll bet he immediately went back into predator mode. And once he reestablished himself with, you know, some, probably moved to a new town and we, we know at least from his history that he was within, uh, several different counties right there in the Tampa area between Pasco County and Hernando County, which are all around Tampa, uh, Hernando County, which is where, uh, Jennifer lived, uh, what's 50 miles North of Tampa and, and Pasco County's right, right in that area too. So the fact that he had multiple cases in around there, it's, it's, that was kind of his area of um, it, his predatory area and where he was, you know, searching out, looking for uh, people to um, assault and, and do his thing. And the, the, it's just so sad. I mean, the sheer fact that he was out in the street at all is, is just crushing to me. But it all comes back to, you know, this situational awareness and there's just far too many kids that just have no idea. But again, you know, a 12 year old is not going to be able to, if, if he just saw that nobody else was around and just saw her walking along the side of the road, 
uh, she would not be, he would be, be able to overpower her really quick. Yeah, if he didn't use a subterfuge, pointing a pistol at her or telling her she's a police officer, get in here, I'm working undercover um, or, you know, any number of things. And he, he, kids, uh, street savvy as they are, you know, they, they're impressionable at that age. So um, it harkens back to two, two cases that I can recall. And one was I was, I was a kid. Adam Walsh back in Hollywood, and that's from a mall. He's taken from a, a mall where there's hundreds of people at any given time, at least dozens of people at any given time, and nobody pays attention on that. You know, maybe the guy looked for it. And, and then the other one was Jimmy Rice down in Homestead, Florida. The Jimmy Rice Act from that and uh, Claude and Claudine and Don d- donated numerous amounts of uh, bloodhounds to the effort to, to find Exactly. Almost identical circumstances. So these things resonate with me. I had a very small part of it in the Miami division when I was working then, but we went out and did some interviews and searched and, and et cetera. And the result was the same uh, horrific, horrific tragedy. Uh, so it destroys the community. It destroys parents. It destroys uh, everything. So you can harden those kids as best as possible. And, you know, us law enforcement types will do that. We um, were, you know, we see, we see that horror show around us all the time out here but the folks that don't understand that and put themselves into it you know let's let's try and harden them you know let's keep them keep them from getting in this as best we can and still keep a free a uh, free america right yeah well uh, you can't you can't you know lock everybody into a room and and wait till they're full adults i mean that that, that certainly doesn't help but the fact that this happens over and over and over i mean lisa jackson in the houston area uh, she was she was abducted. She was just walking home from a, a swimming pool or swimming area, and she didn't have more than a couple hundred meters to go. Uh, her brothers had had left just minutes before she did, and they they just wanted to leave, and she wanted to stay and and hang out and and swim a little bit longer. And next thing you know, she's gone, and they find right. her six, six days later. And so, I mean, it's a it's a miracle that. Uh, the MVAC was actually able to collect the perpetrator's DNA off of her clothing some, what, 35, 40, I I can't remember the exact dates on those right now, but, you know, decades later, they were able to get his touch DNA off of her uh, swimsuit and and T-shirt. And so they were able to solve that case. But in this particular case, DNA played a, a major role again and I, from the sounds of it, I, I, I haven't seen exactly, but I, I think DNA, genealogical DNA, they were able to narrow it down to the sun. And so that tells me that's a YSTR profile, which the Y chromosome is, is only on the male side. But the interesting thing about the Y chromosome is it's passed down from father to son. So, and any, like my father his Y chromosome was passed to me. And so we had the exact same Y chromosome. And so you can, you can do a family lineage all the way up and, and trace that with the Y chromosome. And it's fascinating the way the crime labs can, can take that information. And then, you know, you can basically establish a genealogical line through that. So, and I, I think it's an, it's brilliant by the investigators to be able to, to be able to say, yeah, you know, his son, therefore his DNA or his Y chromosome is going to be the same. And that just narrows down the field. So then he automatically, uh, this, um, uh, Jeffrey Odom or no Jeffrey, um, crumb, sorry. Norman crumb. Yeah. Yeah. He was, they were able to trace him. And then, uh, through other, other means, they were able to compare, uh, DNA profiles and they, you know, that's when he became the number one suspect. So, uh, you know, great, great job by these investigators. And especially because these, these cases around the area, you know, they, they were able to establish this, this MO, which is essentially find some kid that is, gets isolated because she's walking alone, walking back from a, a school bus. And so I'm sure this guy is casing out a junior high. He probably sees uh, you know, and he probably followed multiple buses and he's just following, watching kids get dropped off. And the further out they go, uh, the, the, fir- you know, the, the longer the bus route, the fewer and fewer kids are going to get off on certain spots. 
And then he finally finds one that's just uh, all by themselves or eventually get isolated and uh, snatches them. So it's just, uh, just absolutely, absolutely tragic. But these predators are smart. These guys that, um, you know, they plan and plot and, you know, they do not. That's part of it for them. Yeah. And so they're the ultimate cowards. You know, they, they, they can't get off on any other, you know, their, whatever their sexual fantasies or whatever, they, they can't do it any other way than, than to force, uh, and, you know, maybe it's dominance, maybe it's, um, uh, the act itself, but a lot of times it's just, you know, they, they, their lives are basically worthless. They haven't accomplished anything else in life. And so they just want to exert their power over a child and, 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 you know, maybe it's to punish certain people, but, um, you know, I've also heard of, um, uh, predators like this, they actually, uh, they're so mad at society. Like there was one guy in particular that, uh, I, he was imprisoned in Missouri, if I remember right. And this guy, when he, he gets out of prison and he get he gets a car and he just starts traveling West and he ends up, up on the, uh, the I, um, 90, which is the, the very northernmost highway coming through Montana and, uh, ends up going through the panhandle of Idaho is driving along. He just happens to look over and see a couple of kids playing in a yard of, of a house there. Well, this guy okay. was so, yep. he was so angry that supposedly society was, had punished him and prevented him from succeeding. When in reality, if you end up in the, in the system, you know, the 99.9% chance you screwed up. And so it's not society's fault. I mean, they, yes, there are some that are falsely imprisoned and, and we absolutely want them to, to be released. But the, the vast majority of them, they're there because of some act that they did. Well, this guy obviously wasn't going to accept any kind of responsibility himself, but he realized that if he wanted to punish society the very, very most, the best way to do it is to injure and, and really commit heinous crimes against a child. And so that's why he found this family. He cased them for like three days and he ended up going in, killing the mom, dad, and the oldest brother. He took the, the girl and the youngest boy. I think the boy was eight years old and the girl was like 10 or 11, uh, maybe 12. And he took them af after killing their family, he took them up into the mountains and, uh, did all sorts of horrendous things. And, and just, I mean, ultimately he, he raped and killed the, the little boy and then burned his body. And then he was eventually caught as he was heading out of town with this little girl and the, the sheer miracle that they caught her caught him is, is awesome. But the bottom line is these predators, they understand the, the harm that they can inflict, not only on the, their immediate victim, but also the family and even the society and the community. Because like you said, especially in the, in the smaller communities, it just, it just tears it apart. So any, any thoughts yeah. on, um, further thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. So the noise you hear in the background, I'm going, doing this for my workshop and I've got the garage door open. So I got the longest roll of thunder I think I've ever heard that. So that's, what that was all about. And uh, sorry about that. And, you know, backing up for a second, when I said about the parents and the, I don't think there was anything that could be done when they're so mm, psychotic in nature. I see, I want, I grab. There's nothing you can do about that. Just the same as nobody can stop a sucker punch coming at them. Uh, so you know, if that came across that way, didn't mean for it to do. It's just that these people exist out here and it brings up your point, the evil. But I, I'll say something else. Is, is, it, is it evil that just lives within that person or is it manifested from other abuse? How many sexual predators were sexually abused themselves and that conditioning process? And, you know, you go back to that childhood, that, that young man or woman role that burns their hard drives. This is why you see offenders who would think suffered the most 
heinous actions to them would never do it, but they've been conditioned that that's normal. I, I, you know, I don't have an answer for that, but I do know it's a factor in it. So this guy probably suffered that same thing or not, or not. I do know that probably, um, a deterrent would be the best way, you, you know, waking up society, perhaps that these people exist out here. Uh, the, the, uh, convicted sex offender websites are great, but they have their drawbacks, of course, on this as well. In this time and age where we have such a ability to pass information, we still don't have these people out here. Well, I, you know, I'm all about forgiveness, but my goodness, man, this guy was like a bull shark just swimming around in your, in, in your, in your local beaches here and just grabbing people at random. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the numbers here. We hit, we have, uh, uh, 1980 sexual battery, 81 robbery, convicted 87 of a sex attack. I think this is the one where he gets 18 months. 92 of our 17 year old and 95 on that. And that same story goes over and over and again. Well, I, to me, what I've seen on this is that true, the sex attack and the psychotics that I see I want, but the guys who plan this or even a, a, a drifting over of that or an overlap, the act is one thing, but it's that stalking that does it for them. It's that empowerment that they're able to take. Well, if we can take that away from them, and make uh, you know their stay not a finishing school for them, and not let them sit down and and learn how to be a better psychopath, as they said, you can't treat a psychopath because it makes them a better psychopath. They learn the validity scales and how to get around it. Same way, if we put prisoners with law books and they're and they understand how to how to slalom around uh, the legal challenges and things like this. And I'm not saying you're not entitled to a legal defense. I'm just saying then they become better offenders when they're released. That's what I'm saying. So when these guys become uh, professionals at this, they're uh, able to uh, get away with heinous stuff. I, my, my, uh, in satellite beach where I'm at right now, my eyes drift across where the beach is about maybe 1,200, 1,000 feet from here. There was a young lady raped right in that parking lot over there, a guy by the name of Harry Page, and he gets away with it. He goes to trial, and they can't put it down. They can't introduce other evidence on this. It's just a horror show of stuff out here. So how does that... The answer to it is the community just forgets about it. But do they? Do they? Every cop is just now going, why bother? Why bother when that's out? You know, I don't know the rudiments of it, but we've got to stop that. And we've got to be better at this and we've got to be uh, better all the way around. And that means everybody's responsibility from parents to police, to the press, to the media, to the YouTubers, to the influencers, to anybody who's out there and seeing that stuff. And yes, power is, is a very important thing. You know, stopping somebody and the, and the, and the, um, antagonism that's going on with the police, that's not solving anything. That's just irritating the police and you're taking their resources away from doing that. Better yet, maybe let's, uh, I would like to see that same effort put towards people who are out in areas they shouldn't be that we know that they're not doing. I mean, imagine if we harnessed all of that towards sex trafficking and these sexual offenses, that same effort that's over there to antagonize people in a police lobby. I'm not getting it, Jared. So my little editorial for you on that, but yeah, I think uh, evil walks the earth and um, we can do a better job. Yeah. Well, another thing is, uh, you know, you said there's lots of information that's flying around and, you know, social media and the internet and everything. It's awesome as far as getting information out, but it's also the highly, highly used by these predators and they are, they're experts at it. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if, if it's your, it, that's their trade, that is what they hone their skills on and they become so good at it that, you know, for us to be sitting back here as amateurs and basically saying, uh, you know, our, our kids are okay. Well, they're not okay. You, you need to know what they're looking at. You need to know what they're, you know, viewing on YouTube. You know, there's stuff that's available on YouTube that, uh, and, and other platforms, it doesn't really matter, you know, whether, whether it's, it's not Twitter anymore, it's X, but, uh, Facebook, everything else, it, the, the level of just nasty stuff that's out there. And so parents absolutely need to know what their kids are, are, are viewing and who they're talking to. You know, if, if predators are, uh, are, are 
targeting kids through Xbox and through games and stuff like that. And you just, you just have to know. Right. Yeah. You, the red light district was the red light district going all the way back to the you know, 1800s. It was always understood that if you walked into those areas, there was a certain amount of risk that went along with it. There was a different level of crime and there was a certain amount of naughtiness that the United States is willing to tolerate. I think the world is willing to tolerate. Um, the internet has blurred those lines now and you get a young person who's so much more savvy than somebody you and I are our age right now. Um, then they're quickly online with somebody they don't know. And I mean, how many cautionary tales films are going to be out about that? And the next thing they know they're in over their head. And then we may not even know because who's going to want to confess to that. And the number of missing people's missing people uh, across the, um, the, the States is, you know, it's stunning. It's stunning that's the, how many are out there and, or, or we, they just walked away and don't. The good news is, is we're clearing a lot of these through DNA, but my goodness, you know, yeah, we can do yeah. better. Well, it's, it's, but it is a losing battle because, and I shouldn't say a losing battle. We're, we're falling behind more and more every year. It's like, yes, we're, we're solving a lot of these cases and we being, you know, just society in general. Uh, but there's more cases that are being unsolved or that are not being solved than there are being solved. And so they fall. I, I don't know what the count is now for unsolved homicides, but um, I think it's up to closer to 250,000 now. And just a few years ago, it was like 230,000. So there's more and more. And the solve rates dropped, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the fatigue from the police. I mean, you know, um, it, the fatigue from the police, like why bother? And, and I'm a student of history. I, I've, I've watched it cyclical, you know, and I would say you, you had the 34 was a big turning point. 68 and the seventies was a big turning point. Well, uh, it's cyclical and society is only willing to tolerate so much before you have that big broad ax come down and they change everything. The 34 omnibus crime bill, the 68, you know, um, gun control act that came out with a broad, broad amount of, um, tools. This is what started the criminal justice programs in the universities in 69 and 70 of that time period over here. So that's not the answer. The answer is for men to start stepping up and act like men and take, take control of these things over here. You can't cower anymore. I know it's hard being used to stuff, but this, this is a tough time. So maybe like get involved, read, see what's going on out here. I dare say how many people would know about a rape case and talking about just a few thousand feet over here. And uh, nobody wants to talk about it. You know, I understand that nobody wants to talk yeah. about it. So it's not, not, not a pleasant t topic to talk about. But in the meantime, that select group of say 15 people who worked it are the only ones knowledgeable and a sampling going out to the general public out here. Well, can happen. And it happens a lot. It happens a lot. And that's just talking about the ones that are reported. It's not talking about the unreported, the um, sexual assaults that take place out here because now you have to confess to your parents that you got online with somebody or something like this anonymous person. So, um, but you guys call have the arms. Unique, How about that? Yeah. You guys have a unique problem out there in Florida because you have so many beaches and then that's just such a, a, a spot for, uh, you know, all my friends down in, in Miami beach and you know, the PDs down there, uh, geez, Naples, everywhere else. It's like, mm -hmm. That's such a va vacation spot, especially for spring break and fall break uh, college kids. Yeah, the amount of the amount of sexual assaults and things that happen during that, oh, I, it's it's right. just staggering. Right. Yeah. So, well, listen, man, let's uh, let's wrap this up. The bottom yeah, line so is, there's a guy who uh, is just a, a serial predator, and especially targeting young kids, and. Uh, his latest uh, case that's been solved that he's been tagged with is Jennifer Odom in Hernando County, Florida. And he is, yes, he's in prison. Um, he's serving two life sentences. Uh, and this, But this animal is off the street. And most importantly, uh, hopefully Jennifer's family can now, you know, there, there's no coming back from this. There's, there's no healing. There's no totally ever forgetting it. But at least now they know that the person that killed their daughter and their loved one is, I've been identified and now he's, they, they know he's in prison. He'll never get out. 
hopefully he'll get the death penalty and they'll just be rid of this guy. But, you know, just what a sick, sick guy that it's just, it's sad that it, it took him this long to, to catch him. But it, the, the, the good thing is number one, it shows you the persistence of the police that they never give up there. There's cases out there that are decades old and I guarantee you, uh, the police are not giving up on that case. And if they can solve it in the future, they will. And if they can, they're, they're always doing everything they can, which is the beautiful part of, of what I do with the MVAC system. And Tom, you're part of that as well, that um, because it's such a cutting edge piece of equipment on the cutting edge area of investigation of DNA, that we're kind of always the ones looking at these kind of cases where you're like, yeah, you know what? There's there's evidence out there that once you apply this technology to it, and and it, you know, obviously we're involved with with the MVAC, but there's other technologies that are coming out all the time. And as soon as they're introduced, every investigator, every detective, every CSI, you know, even um, uh, people involved with the prosecuting the DA's you know office, they're they're looking at these technologies and they're like, how can we apply this technology to our cases? And as they come out, then, you know, there's a whole batch of, of, uh, cases that they're able to solve. And it's just, it's a, it's a fantastic thing to watch and just to see mm -hmm. the light come on in some of these investigators eyes. And they're like, holy cow, you know, this might be the way that, um, we're able to solve this case, you know? Well, you're right. The DNA, all of a sudden these units, you know, I do the work with the forensic units and investigative units and i look at cold case historical and everything else so immediately after gsk within two years you saw most uh, detective units would stand up something despite the cutbacks and the shortcomings that are at, at um at the police departments cold case units to track these things back there's a cost associated with each one of these kudos to the um investigators on this because they could have said we got the guy we matched him by motive he's not going anywhere let's move on because it's going to cost us some money to do this. And they continue to pursue that and uh, rightfully so. And so, but there is a cost that's going on with this and, you know, they need funding to do this. We don't want to hear any sort of nonsense like defund the police. That's silly talk. Who are you going to put in charge over there? Soldiers? I'm like other nations. That doesn't make any sense. Or if you want to do that, then train them up and make them, make them soldier policemen or whatever it is. But you got to have this because those animals still live in our midst and they're looking to exploit this system. That's what they do. So, yeah, the DNA is the collection um, thing that does this. So anything like the MBAC, like you're talking about, that's what puts uh, that's what puts them right in the catch net. That's what does yeah. it. That's what narrows it. Yep. Yeah. No, the, MBAC, the MBAC's a, a critical piece, but then genealogical DNA, everything mm -hmm. that they're developing, you know, there's software coming out where they can develop these family trees faster. You know, there's GEDmatch where if, uh, if people want to donate their DNA, to GEDmatch, they can upload it there and then say, yes, police can use my, my DNA, which kind of opens up the family tree. And it's, you know what, it's awesome. And well, yeah, you know, we got a lot of work to do as, as a, as a law enforcement professional, you know, this, this conglomerate, whatever we want to call ourselves over here, but you brought it up so well, Jared, in a previous episode with Ted Bundy's DNA, like, how is that not in CODIS? How does that, how does somebody not it, and it, is it, we don't know what we don't know. It was Lindsay Wade, if, I, if I'm correct on that, yeah. who ran yep. that to ground. Awesome. Awesome work. I mean, I'm sure she didn't get any extra pay for doing that, but that's what I'm talking about. And we need those people, those, uh, those apostles who are going to get out there and make people think and go, wait, this isn't happening. You know, it works on CSI and TV. So those people are going to change it and turn it around rather than go, yeah, the police are really mean to me. You know, they, they really were. Well, it's a tough job taking somebody's liberty or conducting a, a, uh, a Terry stop and talking to someone. No one likes their liberty taken from them. So that's a very sharp knife that you're pointing at somebody when you do that. But that being said, maybe let's, let's uh, think about the other side of the equation. Let's power these guys. Let's keep the movement going where we're funding them, not, you know, hamstringing anybody. So. Yeah, absolutely. with that, I can close. How's that? Yeah, that's awesome. All right, Tom. Hey, appreciate it. And for all of you that are out there, please uh, subscribe and, and hit the bell. And so you never miss an episode. But most importantly, uh, make sure you know 
where your kids are are on the internet, uh, you know, where where they are, you know, the, and that the kids are aware. And a lot of times these sexual predator types, you know, it used to be stranger danger, but most uh, sex crimes are committed by people that the kids or the victim knows. And so it's not stranger danger. It's like, you know, you, you cannot touch in certain areas. There's no reason that an adult would touch a child in, in certain ways. And, um, boy, we need to teach that to our politicians, don't we? So, all right, buddy. Hey, all right, Chris, Grant, you, when we'll, yeah, uh, we'll, yep. We'll, we'll talk see to that you on the next one. You got it. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.